respiratory acute responses. So these refer to changes in the respiratory system that occur as a result of physical activity. And these changes occur in the lungs and airways around the body. They generally aim to get more oxygen into the body, which can then be transferred via the cardiovascular system to the working muscles, allowing more ATP to be produced aerobically. So respiratory just refers to like breathing systems, so the lungs. So one of our acute responses is increased respiratory rate. Um, I think an easy way of memorizing a lot of these acute responses is kind of imagining yourself like getting up out of the exam room and going for a run. If you just think about what happens to your body when you start going on a run, you'll think, okay, I'm starting to get a bit out of breath. Okay, what is that? That's an acute response. If I'm out of breath, what system is it? It's going to be the respiratory system. Um, why would I be out of breath? Well, your body is trying to get more breath more breath, more oxygen in, okay? So respiratory rate is the number of breaths taken per minute. So respiratory breath, sorry, respiratory rate is breaths per minute. When exercise starts, respiratory rate increases and this results in more air entering our lungs. So we start getting out of breath and increasing our respiratory rate because we're starting to use quite a lot of energy and our body needs to make more. So it goes, wow, we need more energy. We need more oxygen, therefore because we need to use our aerobic system. So it starts to um, breathe faster, increase our respiratory rate, and therefore results in more oxygen getting into our body. <clears throat> I am really thirsty. So hopefully that would make sense. So something else called tidal volume, and this is the amount of air inhaled in a single breath. So, that's the amount of tidal volume you have, like taking in a single breath, thinking of how much that volume of air there, that's tidal volume. So as exercise begins, tidal volume will increase. Tidal volume plateaus at a high but not a maximal intensity. So ventilation is another um, respiratory acute response and this actually has a formula associated with it. And so ventilation is the product of respiratory rate and tidal volume. So V equals TV times RR. It's really annoying that you have to memorize formulas, but you have to do it anyways, and you don't actually get a formula sheet. So it is something you do have to remember. Um, I didn't really have any good mnemonics for this. I would just pretend like I didn't really get a Starbucks because I don't really like it very much. But they had like venti cups at Starbucks, and I would like pretend like someone's initials were TV or RR, or both of them, in a Starbucks cup. And so I would like draw out a little cup and be like, it's a venti sized cup with TV times RR. And that was just kind of my mnemonic to help me remember this because it's just an annoying formula to remember. So if you come up with something which is a better mnemonic at remembering this formula, let me know in the chat so I can tell everyone else. Um, but yeah, I don't really have a lot of mnemonics for this. It's just really trying to memorize the formulas and it's kind of not fun. But you have to do it anyway because it'll be on your exam. So hopefully you can come up with something. Anyway. If ventilation is a total amount of air inhaled per minute, you can see breaths per minute is respiratory rate and air per breath is tidal volume. And this is air inhaled per minute, which is a combination of them both. An increase in respiratory rate of tidal volume will result in an increase in ventilation, obviously. So if I increase this one or this one, it's going to increase this one, meaning that more air and therefore more oxygen is able to enter the lungs where it can be diffused and transported via the blood to the working muscles. Ventilation increases linearly with exercise intensity until it reaches the ventilatory threshold. And so this occurs at about 65 to 75% of maximum heart rate, sorry, maximum oxygen consumption. And after this point, ventilation will increase more slowly. <clears throat> cool. Um, hopefully this makes sense. Just touching on this one, so when you breathe in, the air enters your lungs, it actually diffuses through the alveoli um, into your bloodstream, and it's transported into the blood. The blood then carries the oxygen in something called hemoglobin, which is like an oxygen carrier molecule, and it transports it through the blood to the working muscles, where it will then transfer it to myoglobin, which is like the oxygen carrier in the muscles. And once it's there, you can use that oxygen to actually facilitate aerobic um, uh, respiration or that aerobic system actually creating energy and so we can create energy aerobically there. Um, yeah so hopefully that makes sense. I feel like we are really ahead of time. We have like a whole hour left and only like 30 slides left. Okay I might spend a bit of time looking at things like this. 
although I don't really like this diagram very much. Um, I guess what it's saying is it's discussing your ventilation. And at submaximal exercise, you know, you won't be majorly out of breath. You'll be, I mean, your, your breathing's increased. Okay, we'll start from start. Say your resting breathing rate or um, ventilation is at 20 um, arbitrary units, I guess, or 20 um, liters of air per minute, something like that. Um, as you increase your intensity to the submaximal, you can see that it will rise to about 100, um, and then it will start to decrease as you recover, right? And it will go down as you recover. However, when you are exercising maximally, it's going to keep increasing. You do need a higher amount of oxygen in order to facilitate the exercise that you are um, engaging in, okay? And so you're actually increasing the amount of oxygen your body is requiring here. You can also see that, like, as you start to recover, um, it's going to dip down quite steadily, but it will actually take a longer period of time before it can refer return back to our pre-exercise level, whereas the submaximal one gets there a bit faster. So seeing how... Um, Increased intensities mean kind of an increased return time or an increased recovery time is associated with it. <clears throat> you can see there's a slower decrease associated with the maximal intensity as opposed with the submaximal intensity of exercise. Another respiratory acute response is something called increased pulmonary diffusion. I just think pulmonary refers to lungs. What I always do in... Um, with biology and stuff, I always look at the etymology of words. And so if I'm stuck in a word and I can't quite like grasp its meaning, I'll look up pulmonary etymology and it usually has some like interesting phrase tied to it and it helps me remember it a bit better. Like acetabul acetabulum, I think, um, which is made up of your like pubic bones, it actually means vinegar cup because it was used in like rites where they would drink vinegar out of the three bones. And so something like that helps me remember things. So if you're having trouble with these names, like pulmonary or um, I'm not sure this area of study has quite a lot, really, of like intense long words like that. But if there are, definitely look up what they mean or look up the etymology and there might be a nice story associated with them and it might help you to remember it. Anyway, the last are acute responses, um, increased respiratory rate, tidal volume and ventilation. They all allowed more oxygen to enter the lungs during exercise. However, it's not until the oxygen actually enters the blood that it's able to be transported to the working muscles and used by the aerobic energy system. So, <clears throat> in order to allow the oxygen to enter the bloodstream, we've got a process known as diffusion taking place. And so diffusion means the passive movement of gases from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, which seems quite technical, but I will try and explain that on the next page. Anyway, this exchange of gases occurs somewhere called the alveoli in the lungs. So our lungs have these little branch structures, two lungs, right? Um, the branches kind of like peter out and they end up with these little like grape-like sacs, um, very small air-filled sacs that look like grapes. These are known as the alveoli. And so what happens is that the oxygen gas goes down to the alveoli and it diffuses from these alveoli into the bloodstream, which is kind of like next to it, its capillaries and stuff there. And during diffusion, gases move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So there is a nice diagram there, which I will use in a minute. As there is lots of oxygen in the lungs, it moves into the capillaries of the bloodstream. So capillaries are really thin vessels, and they're really good for diffusion. So they're super thin, so gases can quite readily cross them. So carbon dioxide moves from the bloodstream, where there is a high concentration, to the lungs, where there is a low concentration. So essentially, you've kind of got the swapping of gases occurring here. You breathe in, you take in oxygen, the oxygen goes down your lungs, it goes into the alveoli, it would then diffuse from the alveoli into the um, bloodstream by the capillaries. You've got carbon dioxide, so carbon dioxide is already in your blood because it's already, um, you know, the oxygen's been extracted from it. And so the carbon dioxide will, is at high concentration in your bloodstream. It will actually go to your lungs and it will move from the bloodstream into the lungs. So you kind of have carbon dioxide and oxygen swapping over. And so the carbon dioxide will be exhaled out and the oxygen will go down into your bloodstream and go up to the working muscles where it needs to be used. This then allows the oxygen to be transported to the working muscles and the carbon dioxide can then be exhaled. And this increased diffusion results from an increase in the surface area of the alveoli. So alveoli are very small. Things with a very small um, volume have a higher surface area. 
to volume ratio and therefore they're really good at exchanging gases. So alveoli are like highly specialized at this. This is what an alveoli looks like. It's like a grape-like structure. It's covered in lots of um, capillaries. So capillaries are those small vessels, very thin, very good exchanging gases. So you breathe in, oxygen enters your lungs, it gets into the alveoli. You've also got um, carbon dioxide returning from your body. It wants to leave the bloodstream and so these alveoli are covered with capillaries. These capillaries are very thin, very good at diffusion. And so the carbon dioxide goes from an area of high concentration, there's a high concentration in the blood here, enters the alveoli and to be exhaled out. And the oxygen will move from here where there's a high concentration to an area of low concentration in here. And so it will swap. So they essentially swap places, allows us to efficiently get rid of the carbon dioxide and use that oxygen gas and take it to our working muscles. Um, so you can see here, we've got our lung sac, the alveoli, we've got our capillary on the outside, um, deoxygenated red blood cells get rid of that carbon dioxide and the alveolar air here is full of oxygen which then gets substituted into the bloodstream and that goes off to the working muscles. Um, I don't really need to know much about the rest of these uh, parts of the, the alveoli. Um, but yeah, pretty much exchange of gases because of the alveoli and this allows us to um, have effective so effective substitution of gases and allows us to bring that oxygen to the working muscles, thus enabling us to work aerobically or more effectively aerobically. <clears throat>